Stone Barrington sat at his desk in his office on the ground floor of his Turtle Bay townhouse, finishing a stack of work that his secretary, Joan Robertson, had created to keep him busy. He was a senior partner at Woodman and Weld, a prestigious firm housed nearby in the Seagram Building on Park Avenue at 53rd Street, but he preferred to work in his home office because people didn't wander up and down the halls asking him to work on the accounts of various clients. Joan rapped on his door and came into his office. I have a new client for you, she said. Don't groan and roll your eyes. Stone stifled a groan and tried to keep his eyes straight ahead. All right, what waif have you picked up on the street? She's not a waif. She's an aunt, mine. My mother's younger sister. Her name is Annetta Charles. Why isn't her name Robertson like yours? Because she had the wit to marry a very rich man named Edwin Charles. Some switch in his frontal lobe came on. Edwin Charles? I'll wait while you try and catch up, Joan said. The Edwin Charles? Welcome back to full consciousness. Edwin Charles, Stone now remembered, had occupied an elevation at approximately the Rockefeller level of existence. He had died a few months earlier from mysterious ill health. And how may I serve, dear Mrs. Charles? She's going to explain that to you, Joan said. Shall I show her in? Does she have an appointment? Aunt Annetta does not make appointments. She just arrives and people, smart people, see her immediately. Any advice? Don't kowtow too much. She doesn't like it. Stone stood up and put on his jacket. Please don't keep Mrs. Charles waiting. Joan disappeared and returned a moment later, escorting a handsome woman who appeared to be somewhere in her forties. She was perfectly dressed in the manner of New York's women of the Upper East Side and even managed to show a bit of tasteful cleavage. Stone, Joan said, this is my Aunt Annetta, Mrs. Edwin Charles. Aunt Annetta, she said, this is Mr. Stone Barrington, a senior partner of Woodman and Weld. How do you do, she said to Stone. Very well, thank you. Will you please be seated? She did so, flashing a glimpse of thigh as she crossed her legs. How may I be of assistance to you, Stone asked. I want to make a new will, she replied. As she did so, she reached into her commodious handbag, withdrew a thick document, and tossed it onto Stone's desk. It landed with a thump. May I ask uh, what firm currently represents you? Stone asked, thumbing through it. A little collection of desks called Woodman and Weld, she said pleasantly. I called my attorney, Ralph Mason, for a revision and was told that he was dead. I must say, I would have thought the firm would have notified me. Mr. Mason, I'm sorry to say, passed away the day before yesterday, Stone replied. I assure you, notification is on its way. Well, at least he had an excuse for not returning my call. She brushed away some imaginary lint from her skirt. I'll read this just as soon as possible, Stone said. It won't be as hard as you might imagine she said. I've no quarrel with the contents except for the one document relating to my stepson, Edwin Jr. Stone grabbed a legal pad and unsheathed his pen. What changes would you like to make? First, excise page three. That's the page outlining my stepson's legacy. Stone found page three, pulled it from the document, and set it aside. Done. Now, I would like you to set up a trust for Eddie, she said. It should pay him $100,000 a month for my lifetime. For your lifetime? Yes. Why your lifetime, not his? It's the only way I can think of to stop him from killing me. 
Stone was brought up short. Let me explain, she said. Since my husband's death, I have been receiving threatening notes. I am certain they are from Eddie. He is the black dog of the family.